138th Street, which in many ways is the Wall Street of the Bronx. So you've got a lot of financial service providers along the street. Bodegas, you have small money remitters. And there's a pawn shop, not the kind of financier you'd find on the actual Wall Street. But hey, this is the South Bronx, poorest congressional district in America, where some 40% of residents live below the poverty line. The main service provider on the street is Right Check, where we have our financial service center. Joe Coleman is president of this chain of 14 stores in the South Bronx and Harlem. They'll cash your checks, pay your bills, transfer money 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Something like half these customers are unbanked, meaning they have no bank account on purpose. Jose Benitez is a construction contractor. Every time you go to a bank, there's a problem. You lose time. The bank takes too long to cash checks, he says. Can you sign there for me, please? Yeah. And says cashier Jackie Morell. The bank don't offer all the services that we do. We have prepaid cards. They pay the bills, pay the rent. It's um, different things that they can do in one place. But the best alternative is check cashers, payday lenders, pawn shops. Maybe you assume what I did that they prey on the poor. Suzanne Martindale is with Consumers Union. Many of these products really strip away what few assets consumers have. If you are constantly paying a fee to cash a check, you're losing money on the deal compared to if you simply had an account and were depositing checks. Yet check cashing alone nearly doubled to $60 billion from 2000 to 2010. Why, wondered Lisa Servant. It didn't make sense to me that people would be using a service like this in increasing numbers if it was so bad for them. I had done work in low-income neighborhoods for 20 years, and I knew that people who don't have very much money know where every penny goes. So that's when I scratched my head and I realized there's got to be more to the story. To find out, Servon worked as a cashier at this right check for four months and then wrote a book, The Unbanking of America. She returned to the window when we visited and was reminded of what she'd learned. People on the edge have no savings and often need access to every cent they can get their hands on right away. Welcome to the Michael Brooks Show. I'm Michael Brooks. When Grishkin takes away the graphic. We're left, we are broadcasting live from Brooklyn where left is best as it is everywhere else. Greetings, friends, comrades, and enemies on this week's program. Of course, I'm joined by super producer Matt Leck. Hello. Head theoretician David Grishkin. How's it going? Super producer David Slavic roaming the Digitosphere, the Discord, Twitter, everywhere else in the TMBS growing universe. On this week's program, Marissa Barandaran. She is a professor of law at the University of Georgia Law School author of The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap. We're talking about postal banking, race, intergenerational wealth, and democratizing the economy. Then Felix Biederman from Chapo Trap House, our shared political hero, Louis Farrakhan, has some new interesting comments on Donald Trump and the FBI. Plus, Alex Jones sat down for a genuinely mind-expanding interview with that young man who will not leave his parents' house in upstate New York in Rochester. And we might have something of a new campaign to announce from the TMBS show along those lines. Something to do with let him back in his room, Mr. and Mrs. Rotundo. Plus, shithead on shithead violence as Sam Harris confronts Brett Stevens for the only valuable column that Brett Stevens has ever written. We'll get to that. Plus a new segment with our very own David Grishkum and much, much more on this week's Michael Brooks show. <clears throat> but first we have to start with a moral truism and a little bit of a history behind that moral truism. We need to abolish ice now. Abolish ICE is not just a Twitter hashtag. It isn't just an example or a way of proving your bona fides in Trump's America of opposing racism, of having humanitarian concerns. It's addressing one of the most clear and present dangers in the United States today to human dignity, 
to the rule of law, and it also is a response to what absolutely is, and I think I want to quote a uh, friend of mine and friend of my show and friend of Majority Report, Stephen Robbins, Ronald Reagan, a immigration attorney. It is about ethnically cleansing America. The Republican Trump strategy of deportations, of terrorizing families across the country, of a right-wing talk show fanatic that I was paired against in a TV debate last week who has called for the military to be deployed into cities to round up immigrants. This is on a clear continuum. And it's on a clear continuum with feeding the racial anxieties of the white identity politics of the Republican Party and also an electoral strategy for a party that realizes it cannot move away from a hard right position on race and identity and needs to stay in its core, a white identity party. And if it's going to win and it's going to maintain those demographics, it needs to de-diversify America. That is the thinking behind this. That is the strategy. That is the truth of Buchananism, of Bannonism, of Trumpism, whatever we want to call it. Now, this has been at the forefront because of the policy of separating children from their parents at the border, a moral obscenity. The already over 1,000 children, almost 1,500 children, uh, lost in the system by ICE uh, already. Uh, reports of human trafficking, children working in near slave labor conditions across the country. And of course, we see a whole other parallel private detention facility and labor industry linking together a global privatized system which links refugee management and controls and anti-refugee xenophobia policies in Europe with private prisons, with the detention industry in the United States. This is a global system for managing people that we say are waste, that we say are threats, that in actuality are people both here and in Europe are absolutely would fit any reasonable definition of refugee, and we treat with utter disdain and exploit for every type of labor imaginable from farm to sexual exploitation. Now, there is no clear democratic position on this. There's a clear left position on this, which is that we have to get rid of the criminalization of people, period, and we have to completely accord rights, access, and openness to all undocumented people in the United States, and there needs to be a general amnesty. Abortion, amnesty, and abortion acid, and amnesty sounds good to us. But if there is going to be a democratic position, it at the very least needs to start with a couple of bare minimum markers, which right now the Democratic Party is barely even crossing. They seem to be happy in some ways to allow DACA, which was an important, if modest, step, but a vital step in this direction. They seem happy to maybe make it some sort of political football, but they haven't followed through on it. They could have forced at least a temporary government shutdown several months ago to make the point. And they're back on the ropes with this issue doing another play where the Republicans are so obscene and so dangerous, you have to vote for us by default. And this is really important because there's a history to this. And let's be clear about this history. Is what Trump is doing worse and in many respects unprecedented? Yes. Is the design and the plan of why Trump would do something like this different than why Obama or George W. Bush, incidentally, or Bill Clinton would pursue anti-immigration policies. It is, because even in George W. Bush's case, there was some design towards some type of deal on immigration, whereas in the Trump vision, in this iteration of the Republican Party, the goal is simply to drive those numbers down and play white identity politics. That's a vital distinction. And any person whose only ability to process the war on immigrants and ICE terrorism that's happening right now is to say, Obama did X, is a bad faith what about actor. Now, conversely, 
if someone is only able to process the cruelties and the viciousness of Trump and his ICE without understanding the history of these policies and the culpability of Clinton, Bush, and Obama, then they're not serious about an actual humane and systemic change to immigration. So let's touch on this history uh, briefly. During the Clinton years, President Clinton, in fact, signed very punitive, very bricious anti-immigration legislation in the mid-90s that was passed through the contract with America, Newt Gingrich House of Representatives, which was part of that very nativist in views far-right lurch, along with his attacks on welfare, um, his demonization and harsh criminal and ju criminal justice stances, Clinton also signed legislation which saw a lot of young people, including for relatively minor crimes, deported back to places like El Salvador. MS-13 was created in LA in the 1980s, and it was created by El Salvadoran, young El Salvadorans, who were fleeing and seeking refugee status here because of a brutal military junta that the Reagan administration was supporting there already leading El Salvador to be one of the most violent uh, and dangerous places to be um, in, uh, in the Americas. George W. Bush also pursued very punitive immigration policies, although it did work to make a very business-friendly deal, which did have labor problems, but would have been a small step forward. Barack Obama did the DREAM Act. He did some very important steps, but he also, particularly in the beginning of his terms, ramped up deportations and also handsomely rewarded and funded ICE. Now, it seems very clear that the reason he did this was to build political capital in that same sort of delusional sense that by triangulating, you can bring Republicans over to your side and you can work out some type of grand bargain, which you can't. That's impossible. So we have a situation with regards to the immigration where the moral thing to do, the politically wise and savvy thing to do, and the most policy coherent thing to do all synchronize. The moral thing to do is abolish ICE, grant amnesties uh, with proper carve outs for people who might actually pose some type of risk, although that's an incredibly small amount of people. Broad amnesty rights and access for immigration for immigrant communities now that's ethically the right thing to do you'll stop and abolish and stop ice terrorism then you will yes in fact help generate a new demographic and voter bases for a different coalition to govern america which is beneficial to any center to center left to actual left project that's reality and it's the most coherent policy because in order to ensure safety bring new people into the labor market, not have whole slews of the economy and areas of unreported activity across the board, is of course to bring people into the system and have them be protected and not terrorized. So that's how we can synchronize. And we need to agitate every step of the way because there is no indication that the current leadership of the Democratic Party is really willing to see beyond uh, the opportunity to use this as a cudgel to demonstrate what we already know, which is that Trump and the modern Republican Party are disgusting. And in fact, yes, agents of white supremacy, but it's a strategic white supremacy. And we need to have a strategic ethics with a broad-based amnesty and rights for immigrant communities across the board. And the first step with that is add to the litmus test, abolish ICE now abolish ice now period no bullshit now let's uh let's actually move relatively quickly to uh the shout out because this was a no bullshit moment but of course first before we get to the shout out what do we have to do gentlemen and we're back we're back Danarchy. Danarchy. I don't want to get greedy, but if Danarchy could give us a shout out beat, that would be ill. Top of the line professionals. <laughs> Let's get to uh, the shout out. Shout out, shout out. Creepy. Shout out, shout out, shout out. Weird. I think that's creepy. It, 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 it's incredible. Shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. This is crazy. Shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. This is out of control. 
<laughs> a little assist there from the greatest broadcast talent of our generation. We got to get to today's shout out. And of course, thank you to the great DJ Danerke, who also does the opening track of this show. On, I believe it was Friday, voters in Ireland did something groundbreaking. They voted to repeal the Eighth uh, Amendment, which banned and essentially criminalized abortion in that country. Now, it was a major win. Over 66% of the vote went for repeal. And this is, of course, going to mean that a lot of women's lives, safety, and autonomy is radically enhanced. But there's also lessons for uh, any type of left uh, or forward-moving political campaign across the globe. And I'm going to quote briefly from a piece in The Guardian. And this is about, uh, they're talking about Save the Eighth, which was the campaign to, of course, preserve the uh, criminalization of reproductive uh, justice in Ireland. Save the Eighth and other anti-repeal campaign Love Both used apps developed by the U.S. company Political Social Media, PSM, which worked on both Brexit and Trump campaigns. The small print told those, told those using the apps that their data could be shared with other PSM clients, including the Trump campaign, the Republican uh, National Committee, and Vote Leave. Irish voters were subjected to the same polarizing tactics that have worked so well elsewhere. Shamelessly fake, quote-unquote, facts. The claim, for example, that abortion was to be legalized up to six months into the pregnancy, which was not true of this uh, bill. The contemptuous dismissal of expertise. The leading obstetrician, Peter Boylan, was told in a TV debate to, quote-unquote, go back to school. Deliberately shocking visual imagery, including uh, posters of aborted fetuses outside of maternity hospitals and a discourse on liberal elites versus real people. But they go on to say that the Irish process had immunity, and that was because the campaign for repeal placed a lot of trust in people and engaged in uh, deliberative democracy and other direct, in-depth citizen engagement so that they could actually work through the issues and engage in a truly long-form uh, in-depth process where people could go through these things issue by issue. And I think ultimately, you know, look, Modern campaigns, obviously, every side is going to have social media and advertising and all of these types of uh, tools. There's no way around that. But at the same time, this is another area where uh, uh, cynicism and idealism can converge. Left politics and actual power for real people. Like, what does it take to get teachers to go out and strike? Right, this incredibly brave, this incredible bravery we see across the country, with teachers striking or any type of serious mass labor action. Well, of course, it takes conditions being pushed to such an extreme that people need to take those steps. But it also takes a really politically engaged and discursive culture where people have a sense of power and claims over their own issues. And a political process is not just man managed by a disconnected technocracy that thinks it can. Um, you know, manipulate people with data instead of emotions, which certainly is a fool's errand. Uh, so this was an incredible success in Ireland. This will make people's lives radically better there. Um, of course, first and foremost, women, but in fact, everybody. Um, and this was a triumph, not only of a needed and vital policy change, but also of a way of doing politics, which is going to be elemental to any type of left project anywhere. And now we're going to talk about why you should join this left project. And don't worry, you'll hear from Matt and Grishkum soon. They're just, uh, they're recovering. They shared an opium pipe before the show, so they're a little out of it. Um, do we have the uh, pitch music ready? <laughs> NBA season? LeBron versus the Warriors. What's your pick? Actually, I want to know what's over and under on that series from both you guys. Um, I'm definitely going for LeBron, but I think the Warriors in like five or six. Okay. Rooting for LeBron, but picking the Warriors in five or six is not even much of a contest there. I don't know who's who's got home, but it's if the Warriors got game five at home, it's the Warriors. Okay. Grishkum. I don't need any nuance. Uh, I'm going for LeBron. So just going for LeBron. Not even a prediction. You're just rooting for LeBron. Oh, I mean, I, I appreciate greatness. And in basketball, I've never really been a team player. I've always been more of an individualist. No, I, to I, I me too, but I'm saying if you... Ha oh, 
will find me in basketball, maybe because there's so many black guys. Goddamn communists. Um, I'm going to pick uh, Golden State in but uh, seven. I think it's going to be close. I hope you so. You just can't put LeBron on the floor and not think that there's a very high probability that he could figure out a way to win the game. I mean, that being said, you know, I don't know if he can show – like. They got lucky with the Celtics, I think, because the Celtics are such a young team. Yeah, I think they, a little bit more of a their two best guys team, they would have won. What? If they had either Kyrie or Gordon Hayward, they would If they had they Kyrie won. or Gordon Hayward, they would have won, for sure. But also, but LeBron is LeBron. All right. Yeah. And uh, and I never, I have never understood the hate on LeBron at all. No, I think he's great. I was a Kobe guy like back in the mid two thousands, and I don't think it's even close. Um, I think I well, I, think, I like Kobe too, but I understand why people didn't like him. I don't understand, understand why people don't like Kobe. Yes. Oh no, I, I don't mean, like, understand why people don't like LeBron. I think most LeBron hate is old Kobe guys. Oh, I see. It's that's just, what I they think. They just they just don't like the young. Yeah, exactly. The interloper, the yeah. usurper. Yeah, that's probably no. But there was a lot of other like, even that thing that he did when he left Cleveland, and he did the whole countdown to going to Miami. Oh yeah, that was lame. Though. It was lame, but it was also like guys like you don't own him i mean yeah, like he, he has a right to do something that's lame you know like the response to him was a little bizarre and that actually made the league not to get into basketball talk but that made the no. league more interesting too because you have all these super teams now and i i think that's actually fun you to like watch. the super teams. i like it during the playoffs i mean i've probably watched a bit less regular season than i would have but i don't even think that's true i like i like this during the playoffs it's fun to watch people excel all right speaking of people excelling tmbs is doing well we're growing um we appreciate all of you there's going to be a new woke bros this week i was actually very was and i were at an event on saturday and we were very drunkenly plotting out content well that's a total lie we were drunk and we were together but we were not plotting out content but there's going to be more woke bros um which is of course the new offering for tmbs patrons and count the dings patrons our comrades our brothers our fratellos over there this week's illicit history, Doug Lane and I are going over a primer of basic Marxist concepts, um, which is a good sort of re-anchoring uh, re of so much of the content. If you haven't yet, check out Bill Fletcher Jr. on the global Marxist tradition. That was an amazing deep dive, and we unlocked that for everybody. Uh, the week after, Mark Blythe. That next one's going to be just for patrons. Within the next, I think now we're really in the weeks, um, we'll have our own YouTube channel up. That's very very close um that of course will uh, help us diffuse and move uh and get our content out more and more and more next week next animation right wing mandela thanks so much to all patrons if you haven't done it yet it's time help us sustain what we already have and make those next uh movements of growth patreon.com slash tmbs patreon.com slash tmbs we'll be right back with Marsa Barara Darren. Welcome back to the Michael Brooks Show. I'm Michael Brooks, and we're going to get through this. Let me see. Not no, the interview, of course, is going to be an incredible uh, pleasure for everybody. But Marsa Barara yes. Darren. Eh? Barara Darren. Yes. Uh, I, I will. I, on our second <laughs> or third talk, I will get this right. She is the author of The <laughs> Color of Money. Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap, and she's a professor at the University of Georgia Law School. Uh, Maris, Mar <laughs> Marissa, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. All of my Persian-speaking viewers in Dubai, <laughs> in LA, they're just shaking their heads at me right now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> She's like, yep, and me too. Um, yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell me, how did we get this idea? Let's let's go back to the history, the sort of, I love the history of your work and the anchoring of history in your work throughout. How did we get the idea that after the abolition of slavery, that a sort of somewhat and even that of course we know is very tentative but you know at least in some ways a legal political freedom translated to um economic empowerment where did we get that idea and why is that not the case um so i actually think it was always a cynical idea um i actually don't think anyone believed it in fact i think they knew that if the freed slaves got land 
that would mean freedom, which would mean that they would stop growing cotton, which would mean that they would start growing subsistence crops, which is what happened in Haiti. So when the slaves uh, revolted in Haiti, they got land and they didn't want to grow sugar and cotton anymore because those were debt crops. Those were cash crops. They wanted to feed their families. Um, And so the fear was if you give 40 acres um, to the free slaves or any property or capital, access to capital, in other words, actual freedom, that they would not grow cotton. And the South and the North, by the way, the industrialists in the North and the cotton producers in the South and the you know, credit merchants and the bankers in Liverpool all needed southern um, freed slaves to grow cotton. And so it was decided that, um, you know what, instead of land, you're just going to be a sharecropper and you will protect yourself through contracts and capitalism uh, will protect you. And um, and of course, I, I, I don't actually think anyone believed this. I think it was very much... Um, the only thing that was possible, you know, as James Baldwin says, uh, you know, re- uh, reconstruction was basically, uh, you know, you freed the slaves and then delivered them back to their masters in a different arrangement. I mean, many sharecroppers ended up working on the very plantations that they were enslaved on. And now they were just paying debt. I mean, probably it was better, you know, but um, marginally so. So, and then, but somehow, I mean, okay, so that makes total sense that you would have a cynical story, which sort of, you know, there's the, the economic imperatives of basically the capital class, and we need to keep essentially having this slave labor source, but the legal mechanisms have changed. So we need a policy framework to justify essentially continuing the same core economic policies. But then we need a story, a cultural story that is the container for the policy And then it seems to me, and the other thing you chronicle, and maybe you can kind of move us through more history here, is that that basic coupling of we're going to engage in ruthless economic exploitation of, in this case, African-American people, and then we're always going to have a corollary story that it's their, you know, perfidy and recklessness that means that they're not, you know, taking advantage of their freedom, quote unquote. And we could see shades of this going back in, in your work and in, in, in that you chronicled in the culture from uh, this moment after slavery all the way up till like the sort of trying to pin the 2008 collapse on poor people buying houses. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's always been this moral tale to poverty and not just black poverty, yeah. obviously any sort of class distinction, you the poor are often blamed for their own problems, you know, and the and the and the class distinctions, I mean, they see they have to be somehow earned. Otherwise, you know, you can't justify capitalism. And and in every, you know, era there has been a different um, you know, I talk about the gods of each era. And and you know, I think during the um slavery era, the justification was actually like God and the Bible, you know, deemed it that the white man should be the uh, capital and the black slave should be labor. And this was, you know, the mark of Cain, blah, blah, blah. So actual God, d- divine right. Um, and then that was, you know, not, uh, you know, uh, supportable anymore. And then we moved to like social Darwinism and you've got the charts of, you know, um, certain white classes on top. And then you've got, you know, Jews in the middle and, you know, Mongols lower to the end and blacks on the bottom. And, oh, wow, it turns out that, it actually matches exactly to the, you know, economic hierarchy. And, you know, Irish, like Irish weren't white, you know, so they were low on the rungs, but, you know, because they're poor. Um, and then, and, and that obviously fell out of favor after Hitler took that to the extreme. And I think in this era, um, the modern era, the gods are of the market, you know, you've got market efficiency and, you know, um, uh, capitalism and, and market demand and, and the, and the, the price of your labor is why you're poor. You're, you're not producing something that is valuable. And, and so, you know, this market fundamentalism uh, or um, economism becomes the, the justification for inequality. I'll take you on a brief tangent. I want to go to the 60s, but um, do you think that just as in, in this, I mean, it's connected, but a brief tangent. Do you see in this sort of new era of, and actually not necessarily new because it goes back to the 80s with, or the, yeah, the 80s, but particularly the 90s with Charles Murray, that sort of synthesis of like a resurgent sort of neo social Darwinism with the market fanaticism 
through these different like oh well we're not doing these old like you know race hierarchies this is all new this is iq this is you know this is clean science it happens to restate the same stuff yeah, you know, you've talked about this in, in your show before, but like, I mean, yeah, I see Charles uh, Murray being like, oh, this is this new science. I actually think it's it, Charles Murray's like just straight up social Darwinism. I mean, I, I really don't think there is that, that much of a break. I and mean, I think some people like maybe Patrick Moynihan and others like will say, OK, well, maybe poverty was caused by history, but there's this cultural phenomenon, too. So I think there is that component of like a cultural explanation. And I think you know, that's been thoroughly debunked as well, although certainly um, poverty changes, you know, uh, the, the mix of, of decision making. But but the Charles Murray cohort, I mean, that is like an idea as old as, you know, um, uh, the, you know, the guys at Columbia who are measuring skulls, you know, and IQ science as as though we have like that's a real science in and of itself, let alone that we have any indication that there's like a genetic determinant that is racially determined. I mean, so, so, so I mean, the Charles Murray phenomenon, I mean, this is, it, it's just so funny that you are, you know, that, oh, these people won't let us examine this new research. Like, please, it's like all we've ever heard always is this exact same thing. So this is not new. It's been thoroughly debunked over and over and over again. And maybe when you have some new data or some new science, then let's talk about it. But like, you know, until then, like just, you know, it's caused so much damage that you've got to stop talking. <laughs> right. And there's no, right. There's no ethics a- around it. And it's just the sort of recapitulation, restating of old stories. Um, when you go to the 60s, this is another and, you know, it's not as extreme, obviously, but I, there is an interesting parallel um, and that maybe can kind of like, you know, take and then and then you can maybe take us through the 80s as well. Uh where you know there's there's the formal legal mechanisms of which like you know in this case like like american apartheid jim crow is dismantled legally and then there's still this sort of coral you know it doesn't basically it doesn't happen the economics don't happen at the same time and it's interesting because i've been reading about this recently and i want to just throw this out there too and see how you respond to this as well that the, there was sort of like a kind of, you know, Robert F. Kennedy actually had a relatively right wing critique of some of the sort of social pro- programs of the 60s. But from the perspective mm-hmm. of like people who, you know, they shouldn't uh, in his case, you know, it sounds Republican, but I think we can give him a little bit more credit than Republicans. He actually was interested in some mm-hmm. mechanisms potentially of participation and empowerment. And then you also had people, you know, socialists, basically, and Marxists who were very critical of the sort of like punitive paternalistic sort of way that these programs are getting implemented because again from even you know there was from the like perspective of like these programs are not letting people fully participate in capitalism and acquire wealth and there was also the critique that you know these programs are not about gaining power and autonomy of any kind um so i wanted to kind of put that in the mix but it seems like there's another process where something gets taken off the book but the economics don't follow um with the rest of it Absolutely. I mean, I think it's hard for us to understand how much of the civil rights movement was embedded in this um, Cold War sort of framework. I mean, really, at the time, like capitalism was on the margins, like it, 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 it like a lot of people predicted that the Soviet Union would just win, you know, and the capitalism still had to like prove itself. And, and so one, so that actually led to some power for the civil rights movement. So you have in the 50s or before JFK, before Martin Luther King, the State Department telling, you know, President Eisenhower and Truman, like, we have got to fix our racial problems because the Soviets and the Chinese are using them against us as propaganda to like further other regimes to communism, right? So, yeah. so the State Department really pushes these like you know, like we need we need better race stories because like we're getting, you know, worked abroad. Right. So so that leads to some acceptance of the civil rights movement. So JFK is very much I mean, not that like, you know, this it was there wasn't some actual, you know, like, you know, sympathizing with the American black struggle. But there was also a, you know, a, a global sort of uh, domestic uh, policy or sorry, foreign policy component as well. Um, but then you have sort of this you know, late 60s, um, as 
socialists are gaining a foothold in in the states, right? You've got this um, backlash that turns against the civil rights movement itself. So Martin Luther King is obviously, you know, pinned as a socialist. All of the principles of the the civil rights movement um, are very sympathetic, and they're really moving in that direction. In fact, I, I actually think if you look at MLK's early, mid, and late work, there's that economic justice element, this mm-hmm. sort of socialist, populist, call it what you will, streaks throughout. So he very much understood, I and mean, he talks about segregation is not about race, it's about, you know, uh, imperialism and oppression. You know, a lot of Malcolm X is talking about the black struggle in the North as, as a colony, right? This is imperialism. And, um, you know, he, he says, show me a capitalist and I'll show you a bloodsucker, you know? Right. So, so this was all. That's one of the taglines for our the- show, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, this is you know, and, and so all of them, the Black Panthers, of course, very much a socialist um, inspired movement. And so, so really that backlash against them is, is wrapped up in Hoover sort of like trying to, um, her, or the you know, FBI trying to shut down um, uh, communists. And so, so, so I think, you know, you, you, and then you have Alan Greenspan. So when Nick, Richard Nixon comes into power in 1968, um, you know, the world, I think, changes from, you know, 1965 when the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act are passed to 1968 when Nixon is elected president. You've got the Vietnam, you know, marches. You've got this, you know, Cold War sort of thing heating up. And once Nixon comes in, he comes in with this white um, and conservative backlash to all of it, not just civil rights, but socialism and the hippies and the and the draft dodgers and all all or the draft protesters and all of these um, these social forces. And and Alan Greenspan, you know, is Nixon's uh, economic advisor. So part of that whole thing is this like libertarian streak, and of course, libertarianism then comes in against the civil rights movement. So as soon as the black um, black Americans start demanding the same socialist programs, by the way, of the New Deal that had created a white middle class, as soon as they start asking to be dealt into that, you get this libertarian backlash that says, oh, well, that's anti-capitalist. Anyone who calls for in, you know, integration or reparations is a socialist communist, and we can't do that. So Alan Greenspan literally writes this letter to Richard Nixon and says, you need to stop with the civil rights stuff. It's anti-capitalist. Milton Friedman's Capital and Freedom. He talks about civil rights laws. I mean, the civil rights law itself was anti-capitalist. I mean, he says racism is, you know, is, is not efficient. And so racism will go away if the government just gets out of the way. Right. Um, that's Milton Friedman's whole push in that book. So, so I think it's all bundled up and, and it's hard to disaggregate, but, but it's, it's a real clear shutting down of any social economic movement. And so then does that lead to like in the 80s, obviously Reagan is elected. There's a lot of attacks, uh, uh, you know, across the board. I mean, gutting what is already a really modest social safety net in the United States. Then also you've talked about how in the 80s was when community banks started pulling out of uh, communities of color. And then, you know, in the Mm -hmm. 90s, we have just like mass financial services deregulation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that starts in the 70s. And, you know, there's uh, inflation. So the Fed becomes hyper fixated on that. You've got, you know, um, the, the total deregulatory spin of, of Reagan. And then, but on the same hand, you know, you're deregulating financial markets and you're sending, you know, the, uh, the Gestapo, the police into, you know, black and brown communities to imprison all of the, you know, all of the, 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 uh, uh, anyone basically that is out of line so so it's this weird libertarian thing but only for you know white um bankers uh and the rest of the people um you know it's just it's increased carceral straight and that that goes through clinton you know um obviously that that story has been been told but but you know really it's nixon and this division of this 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 um decision of the Republican Party to go with the Southern strategy and with, and then linking that Southern racist strategy with this libertarian streak, and then trying to get, you know, um, trying to cut across. And this has happened several times in history where you have almost a coalition of white poor and black poor and brown poor sort of joining forces against the oligarchs 
and then it being undercut by race baiting. And Nixon just did that expertly right as that movement could have really gained traction. This happened in um, the early 1900s in the populist um, sort of revolution in the South after a recession where you've got these black leaders and the white populist leaders saying, hey, look, you know, you white, white, you know, debt sharecroppers and, and black sharecroppers, you have way more in common than your masters. You know, why don't you join forces? And of course, the Southern Democrats cut that and, and go with white supremacy because that becomes a, a more salient political winner, and the northern industrialists would rather have that than the populist support. So, so you see these several times, and of course Donald Trump, right? As soon as you yeah. have, you know, uh, yeah, Occupy maybe, and and other movements of social reform, you've got Trump saying, "No, go with your whiteness; that'll save you." And even though, I mean, obviously, and you know, I want to know what you think of this. I think that like. There's no doubt. I mean, I just have different, pol radically different politics than President Obama, right? I'm, you know, well to the left, mm -hmm. obviously, but he did put that coalition together electorally. So even in that history, to some extent, mm -hmm. so even in that history, I think you could put the types yeah. of sort of margins and groups he was putting together as a question of like people voting together and what they were actually voting for and what was being branded. And I think, in, you know, I think that. Obama's obviously an incredibly appealing person, but the politics were not, you know, they weren't that sort of real push that we need. But he did put together uh, some of those coalitions in the way you're talking about. Absolutely. I mean, I think, look, I, you know, I, um, I had that hope in 2008, you know, yeah. and, and really, I think the first, as soon as Obama picks his economic advisors, I felt like a gut punch, like, are you yeah. kidding me? You know, these guys, but, but, you know, I think, and, and, but, but the surprise came because he really was talking a big time, you know, like, oh, we'll do the new deal again. I mean, it really seemed at least to me that he understood what needed to happen. And, and I honestly think, I think the financial crisis spooked him. I think he was really early on in office. He didn't have the, the chops to, to, to do the fight and you know i like obviously go back in history and have a more experienced president who could have anticipated that that he would have had a window to push for like big time reform of the entire economic sector he had his chance and he blew it um could he have done it i mean if, if the economic crisis had happened on his you know sixth year would he have done it i don't know i mean i, I hope um uh, you know, I don't know. Some people say no, but I, I still, you know, I still like the man. Well, he should do He should. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I do. I think if you don't like yeah. him on a sort of personal style level, I mean, that, that to me is just yeah, weird. I don't exactly. know like, what's yeah. not to like. But, but um, so let me. So then on a, on a slightly more hopeful note, I want to ask you just your thoughts on two big policy ideas that people have been talking a lot about recently. And I'll start with one that you are, I would say, a major reason people are talking about. You, the only reason I know what postal banking is, is because of you. <laughs> and you've also helped write this legislation, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, for Senator Gillibrand. What would postal banking do to help move the ball forward? Yeah, so, I mean, um, there's this problem that I think uh, it's so, it's, it's so catastrophic for people who have to deal with it and totally off the radar for those of us who don't. And this is that all there's, you know, a ton of the population, about 30 to 40 percent of the population who has to rely on payday lenders and check cashers just to use their money or to send it abroad. And this is, you know, 10 percent of their income. These are the people on the financial margins anyway. Um, so I, I've done. Um, research onto this idea. And, and so I thought, you know, look, I mean, let's, let's just start with basic principles, right? Credit policy is a governmental policy, right? All, all banking, forget what, you know, forget your free market ideals on corporations and businesses. We can quibble. But banking is a public endeavor, right? Banking is linked. All banks are linked to the Federal Reserve. We pretend that they're private markets, but we saw in 2008 that we cannot let the nation's banks fail. And what that means is that because banks operate with our money, right? So what that means is they are public utilities, essentially. So, so the idea that you have 
the Fed, not just a Fed, the FDIC, FHA, the, the um, go- government-sponsored entities, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, not just generally day-to-day giving them credit support, but in the, to the extent that they fail catastrophically, there's also a bailout. So once you have all of those governmental supports, you start to understand what banks are and their tools of a federal policy and, and monetary policy. They're connected to the state. So you have this industry, and it's profit-oriented, right? So the banks think that their interests are with the shareholders, but really the public supports them. And so they choose their customers. And what banks have chosen over the last 30 years is to only serve their wealthy customers and to screw them at that, but forget that for now, Um, but to leave out that 40% of the public that it just isn't profitable for them to serve. So if you have less than $5,000 to deposit in a bank, those banks don't want you. That's why they do the overdraft fees. That's why they close up their branches in your neighborhood. And so those people, as soon as the banks left in the like late 70s, early 80s, the payday lenders and the check, check cashers came in. This is a relatively new industry. So over the last several decades, you've got this void being filled with like these loan sharks that are, you know, like um, taking the last, you know, uh, dollars and cents of, of the people who need it the most. And so... The idea with the postal banking is, forget the post office for a second, right? It's just a public option for credit and for um, financial transactions. So banks have a monopoly on the payment system, which is the way, you know, you if you pay someone else, that check has to clear, and only banks have access to that clearing. Um, so, but that's a public entity. That's a public, uh, you know, franchise. That's the Federal Reserve, and so just allowing the post office to do that, right? So offer an account at any post office is just as a public option. Why the post office as opposed to like a public library? Um, several reasons. One is in every developed country abroad, the post office does this. Two, in the U.S. from 1910 until 1966, the post office offered savings accounts. They were, to you know, immigrants, poor people, phenomenally successful. And three, the post office has this mission to serve every community regardless of cost. I mean, it's like the most democratic institution that we have predates the Constitution. Um, so it's, it's very like foundational to the American democracy. And Ben Franklin put this together. The founders decided on the mission of the post office. And, and this is why you have a post office in like random rural areas that have nothing else. Um, so it's in every zip code uh, and the post office should just do it. I mean, it's, it's, it's like... And no, I mean, this is an idea when people first hear of it, they're like, that's crazy. And then they hear more about it and they're like, that's obvious. You know, it's I mean, totally I think obvious. It really... <laughs> yes. it's, it, make, yeah. it's, it couldn't make more sense. It's also I I also heard that Benjamin Ben Franklin actually said that if you show me a capitalist, I'll show you a bloodsucker. Is that true, Professor? <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. Okay. I'm, I'm sure that was Malcolm X. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, maybe Abraham Lincoln. Or, uh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would, he's already really high. That would shoot him up several more points. Yeah, totally. So we need postal yeah. banking. What about a federal job guarantee? What is your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on that? I, you know, I think it's, it's, again, one of those ideas. One, where the devil's in the details. So I've heard a lot of debate on this, and people are like, no, and yes. And, and I think it's because they have different plans in mind. Um, So I think it's a great idea if we conceive of it in the way that the New Deal era program were done, but adapted for the 21st century, right? So the idea would be that, um, you know, you create um, public sector jobs that we need, right? So we have awful infrastructure. We have terrible childcare programs. We have got, I mean, so many services that quote unquote, like perfect markets just fail to perform, right? Um, And we've got people out of jobs. We've got people being underpaid, um, you know, uh, what David Graeber calls like tons of people in bullshit jobs, right? Yes. And so the idea of a federal, right, the federal jobs guarantee is that you would um, create infrastructure programs that operate as a win-win, like postal banking, right? So you have, we need a new highway. We need, you know, solar um, panels. We need some, like, you know, new new programs, new infrastructures, daycare, um, early childhood education, whatever. And you, you you create the program and you fill the job. Um, so that's one element of it. The other is the Federal Reserve component, which I think less people talk about, but it's just as important. The Federal Reserve 
since the 1970s has been like hyper focused on inflation as though that is like a big boogeyman. But it happened once. And it's like this trauma that they're still reacting against. That is not our worry right now. Right. We should, instead of focusing on inflation, focus on job creation and really understand that the Federal Reserve is behind credit policy and take that seriously. I mean, looking at the bailout and the quantitative easing that the Federal Reserve did, what was that if not central planning and social engineering and deciding what things get funded? So the Federal Reserve should fund, you know, public works, public programs, cities and states and localities. Like, why should AIG not be able to fail, but the city of Detroit fail? or Puerto Rico, right? I mean, yeah. so, so we make these decisions and we pretend like there's some, uh, you know, market reason behind it, but it, we're making moral uh, policy decisions. And so the Fed should decide people over institutions with shareholders. And, and granted, I mean, the caveat is that, you know, saving AIG does save a lot of pension holders. Um, but I think there are a lot of ways to directly just understand what the Fed is and, and do it directly to, to just give credit where people need credit and give jobs where people need jobs and create programs that, that we need and fund them because that money comes back in taxes. I mean, money is not this like finite thing, like the new deal, you know, even though it costs a ton of money, it actually um, creates a lot of money. It creates taxpayers. It creates the middle class and all of this wealth that just comes back to replenish the government coffers. It's a virtuous circle. I, I want to just say in closing that I, I really, really appreciate your time. I look forward to many more conversations and I'm anxious because I'm really going to need to get your name down. And uh, I know we'll get there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Marissa Baradaran. Marissa Baradaran. Yay. <laughs> They're laughing at me. <laughs> This is so, this is, I'm, you know, I'm going to really need to assert, reassert my dominator, dominator hierarchy after this interview in a Jordan Peterson sense because of this. Uh, she is the author of The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap universe, and a professor of law at the University of Georgia Law School. I really, really appreciate your time, and I'm very serious. I hope we, this is the first of many conversations. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Okay, guys, here's what we're going to do. We have a new segment that we're about to unleash on the public. Then my, my paisan, Felix Biederman, has just arrived. He's already done his usual. He's, he's always like, hi, do you guys have any uh, fermented mint tea? And we go, no, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> we fucked up. <laughs> sorry, dude. <laughs> We're we're primitive beer drinkers here. Uh, I've been actually cutting down my beer drinking quite a bit, and I think you're you're one of the influences, one of many influences on that decision. But what we're going to do is we're going to do this new segment. Then Felix is going to come up with me, and we're going to do the gulag together. We're all going to crack at this gulag, and then we're going to talk about. I've got a a fucking beautiful Louis Farrakhan clip talking about Donald Trump, and because. Farrakhan is a major I don't I know of no other white person in media that has been as influenced by Farrakhan uh, other than myself as Felix uh, so we're going to get to that uh, and then we have some just amazing clips and we're going to sprinkle them in and out of uh, Alex Jones's sit down with the kid that won't leave his parents house or the 30 year old that won't leave his parents house um, it's pretty amazing uh, and then we have a new we're going to play gulag or re-education camp but first we have a new segment with our head theoretician, David Grishkum. It's called the Grishkum Economic Minute. Because, as you know, and here's, here's his intro music. All right, let's play this. Welcome to the Grishkum Economic Minute. While the rest of the left was tweeting about Roseanne Barr today, there was actual shit going on. And David Grishkum... No, I'm glad the bitch is fired. I'm just saying there are other things... The disparity between tweets about like the death toll being like what is like 30 times the official estimate in Puerto Rico versus the like here's what the tweet should be like fire Roseanne F her done now also 
there's a colonial enterprise and mass underreported deaths in Puerto Rico because of the United States' col colonial policy and vulture capitalists. And then, and then, and then you hunt around and you look for like Jack Posobiec's reaction to Rose, uh, to Rose, to uh, to what's her face, Roseanne getting fired, and then you laugh again. And then you troll him about Bumble. Yeah, and then you troll him about Bumble, and you're like, hey. Uh, so, without further ado, no, but seriously, David uh, is right. Leftists need to follow the financial press, and um, you've been following a story actually about a new debt load up that flows out of quantitative easing in Africa that, well, take it from there, David. Yeah, I mean, actually, the last segment was perfect to sort of ease into this one. Um, I mean, so basically, this is a longer story that's been going on for a little while, but it's something that I've been very worried about as I've been seeing it unfold. Um, throughout sub-Saharan Africa, we're now seeing a median level of public debt to GDP ratio that's around 50%. Um, there's a full-on crisis in Chad, Mozambique, South Sudan, Sudan, and Zimbabwe. And the crisis is unfolding in Ethiopia, Cameroon, Ghana, Kenya, Mauritania, and Zambia. Now, if you're somebody who might know a little bit about you know, GDP ratios and uh, you know, national debt, you might not think that a 50% rate is very high. Mm -hmm. Think about the United States, which is over 100%. Right. But there's a problem in Africa, which is that they have a very low tax base. Right. And they have a very low tax base Let's guess why. Because all the money that's made in Africa it's gets taken out, out of Africa into the United by States the United and States, Europe. France, and China now. And China as well. Right. Um, and just to illustrate that, um, in 2015, there was $161 billion given to Africa in loans and aid. But there was $203 billion taken out of Africa. Right. So that's a $40 billion discrepancy. So the money that's coming in is very quickly being taken out. Right. Um, so what's going on in sub-Saharan Africa right now is we are having huge debt ratios in a lot of these countries, countries that primarily make their money um, through resource extraction. Right. Um, and that's where a lot of the profit is that it goes off into the international markets. Now, to put it simply, why I'm worried about it and what's frustrating about this scenario is a lot of these nations are now being forced to take loans out from private banks. Um, private b banks like uh, Credit Suisse, um, private banks like the Swiss Bank, the Russian VTB, and other uh, American banks as well. Um, and a lot of these loans are coming out at very high interest rates. They're non-concessional. And the money that backed them was mainly a product of quantitative easing. So in other words, these banks who got quantitative easing infusions because of the economic crisis that they created in the West, let's just say for purposes of this conversation, mm -hmm. They use that capital flow to jack up investments in Africa because the whole story of the last decade is that Africa's economy has been heating up. So they went and they flooded and they invested in logging projects and road construction and gas and pipelines and other projects. Um, probably not that many, some, but not that many durable projects. And now as we get back to debt levels that are comparable or exceed, I think you said, 2005 when there actually was an international effort at some debt forgiveness these banks are about to say pay up and f africa again well ex exactly and what's even more ironic is that they had to they couldn't invest money in the u.s and in europe because they had devastated the economy so much right that the the highest interest rates available to them were in africa and you know a lot of these uh um loans that they were giving out were highly speculative um, and, you know, given to very corrupt public-private partnerships, which we know from the United States are typically scams. Right. So you and, had an example from Mozambique. Yeah. So and this is, you know, it's a really sad. And, and the reason this is such an issue is like, so it's a little it's hilarious in a way because there's a two billion dollar loan given to Mozambique to build a tuna fleet. A tuna fishing fleet, which mm. sounds like a kind of dubious investment from the sounds kind of cool. I would like to relocate this show to a Mozambique, Mozambique uh, tuna fleet at some point in my career, actually. But basically, like broadcast the from a boat. The fleet doesn't get built, and the private company that they use the money for, they've now done an audit, and around um, five hundred million dollars of this loan has gone unaccounted for. Right. which most likely means it went into somebody's personal bank account. Right. And the reason this is such a tragic story is because that $2 billion that now these banks are demanding being paid by Mozambique um, is, now being, is the responsibility of the government. And even though that private corporations and right. vampires sucked up this money, 
Um, you know, they were basically now the people of Mozambique are responsible for it. And just two things. Yeah, because the government is going to say, of course, the government can afford it. They just need to slash already utterly meager investments in healthcare and education, and people can starve and suffer to pay us off for our reckless loan that subsidized a corrupt deal. So you have the IMF and the World Bank, who basically for the past 10 years have been pushing austerity right. in, in sub-Saharan Africa and these public-private partnerships. And only now we're starting to get some whispering, if you read the IMF recent reports from 2017, that maybe these public-private partnerships aren't very efficient ways to be oh, spending money. Wow. Um, so, I mean, basically what's going on, and it's the story of what's been going on for the past 30 years, is global finance is a way that international capitalism is able to keep c countries under control, regardless of what democratic elections happen in those nations. Um, not only are the watchdogs asleep at the wheel, they have their feet on the accelerator. And, uh, you know, this debt is getting to a high level that these private banks and financial organizations that own it, they're not going to forgive it, but it's gonna create such a large international crisis as what's very likely is that the United States and Europe are gonna buy the bad debt from these banks and potentially forgive it for these African nations. Meaning again, that the bankers get paid for their irresponsible and reckless behavior while everybody else pays for it. Show me a capitalist, I will show you a bloodsucker, Malcolm X or Benjamin Franklin. That was the Rishkum Economic Minute. This is definitely going to be an ongoing segment. And perfect music selection by super producer Matt Leck. All right, let's take a 30 second, one minute break, um, and then I'll get Felix in the chair, and we'll go to the gulag, and we will move from there. Welcome back, Michael Brooks Show. Joining us now is Friend. Is we all right? What's going on? He's fix his uh, fix his setup. Felix Biederman is with us. He's from Chapo Trap House. And uh, is there anything else that you want us to, to talk about? Um, let's see. What else um, should we identify here? Um, the well, the two other things I'm working on right now. I'm not sure when they're going to come out. One's going to come out far sooner than the last one. The first one I've talked about a bit recently. It's our Twitch stream. We're starting a Twitch channel. I'm incredibly excited about this. Nice. Uh, it would have already started, but the company I got my PC from delayed it by like two weeks. So I, once it gets here, we're going to do some test streams, uh, primarily my Fortnite show, uh, with my friends tentatively titled bird brain on me team. Fuck you mean <laughs> that's the name of our clan, <laughs> but other shows like Will Menneker's cooking hour and a series where Matt plays the Assassin's Creed games oh. because the bad gameplay and bad history will aggravate him. Well, that's, you know, I, when we reached, because I'm, I'm like one of the ways in which I am like so, so alienated from my audience, who I love, is that they are filled with like game players. And I don't fucking like, I don't know shit about games and don't play them. And, um, when we reached our first thousand patrons, the like celebration for the audience was me and Matt and I playing Wolfenstein. And it was, it was a tough road, but the only part that was fun was doing like an interpretive history of how fascists took over in that game. And just like them being like, like, Oh no, we went back to world war two. And FDR being like, you will respect people's gender pronouns. And people are like, well, fuck that. Yeah, well, because there's yeah, a part where you start in a wheelchair. Um, and that sort of thing. Well, that's that's interesting, though. The Assassin's Creed thing is great, because I've thought is about Is Assassin's those. Creed historical? Yeah, well, kind of. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, you'll, in those games, it's like, okay, you'll be in like, uh, I thought the first few ones were good, but then it went off the rails. I like three. the London one a lot, actually. I, Wait, well, I what's hate the, the what's ones. the for 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 game illiterate people? What is the game about? So it's about like it's sort of like the Ender's Game Matrix sort of uh, bullshit concept, which is there are people who they can go into these machines called animuses and live out their ancestors' genetic memories to find like artifacts from a lost civilization for this evil company or like lost menorahs and potatoes. yeah exactly <laughs> and the first one's in the crusades and it's like kind of fun and the next one's in the that renaissance sounds kind of cool they were like pretty cool right. games right, until enough. they just like started cranking them out every year and it just sucked but the history is like leonardo da vinci and like isaac newton like knew each other and were friends and were in the same like club 
They're like, so it's like you, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Exactly. Yeah. It's like <laughs> you know all your favorite guys from history. They were all friends, <laughs> and they give you missions to tail somebody for two hundred and fifty meters. And you keep clipping through the textures because they haven't patched this game yet. <laughs> and you have to you have to protect an NPC that runs straight into guards and gets sliced into bits. But on the plus, side, I actually kind of I would like a, another game tutorial, Matt. Well, one of those NPCs is you get to play as Karl Marx's bodyguard. In the yeah. Movies. You get yeah. to play as Carl Marx's. Yeah, you get to uh, right. escort him to a, like a meeting. Fair enough. And is Carl Marx like, this is my buddy Botticelli. <laughs> 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 We're hanging out. <laughs> that would be awesome. Just, just like start intentionally fucking up kids. Like any like sense that they might even have like timelines. Like like JFK is just like, have you met my friend Angles? We're gonna bang some Swedish girls at this Renaissance art exhibit. They're gonna t they're gonna like uh, full right wing takeover of Ubisoft, the publisher of the game, <laughs> and it'll be one in the '60s, and you have to uh, do a mission for Martin Luther King, and he's like, and the most important thing is you always have to respect people's opinions, no matter <laughs> what. My dream is for everyone to be colorblind. There's no like no one sees color. That uh, it's bad to be racist to white people too. And I like, need Damn, to be I'm learning a lot from this game. I need to be escorted through a college campus and allow my ideas to be expressed freely. You sneak through a crowd at like a, a talk and you have to assassinate the protesters. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Martin Luther King gives you an assignment to protect Ben Shapiro. He's like, all opinions are valid. Friend, Ben Shapiro was at an event recently where he said, quote unquote, Tranny's feelings are real, but they ain't what the gender say the gender is. <laughs> These crazy protesters are a threat to Ben's well being. <laughs> We're gonna <laughs> That should be the the new saw. The new saw should be like uh that the jigsaw guy uh takes is control. Dave Rubin. He's, no, yeah, he's Dave Rubin. He gets five liberals, and he posts the N-word on all their social media, and they have to complete tasks to delete it. <laughs> and he's like, see? see? <laughs> you know, critics are saying... You should what appreciate life more. Yeah, what point... <laughs> critics are saying about Saw 10, what point were you trying to make? What was, what was the point of making this movie... I'm not sure if it has an ideology. We, what is it? <laughs> I'm just picturing Dave Rubin talking with Martin Luther King and him just being like, and you're interested, like you're interested in ideas, not people's skin <laughs> yeah. color. <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Dave Rubin, Dave Rubin as Jigsaw, but still doing his show. <laughs> like giving giving Ben Shapiro riddles. Yeah. Well, that that now all of a sudden that sounds a lot more appealing. It's easy to imagine <laughs> yeah. Ruben with uh, jigsaw makeup on. Yeah, it is very yeah because it is his he, makeup. All right, let's people do... pe people are uh, saying that I'm killing people, but I'm giving them a choice. So it's frankly interesting that they're saying that I'm <laughs> murdering people when I'm actually giving them a choice that makes them appreciate life, which is what liberalism is about. Actually. Did you see I'm Mother Jones's liberal. profile saying that I'm killing people and I'm giving them the <laughs> option to live? Yeah. <laughs> I'll sue you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just wouldn't hide his identity at all. He'd be like, okay, fine, I'm Jigsaw. Yeah, yeah. You know, at TYT, I, I ran this by Jenk. I said, what if we gave people puzzles where they could escape from their own torment or have a... Or, get their their skulls imploded by a vice grip. And he was just like, no, I don't think our audience would be interested in that. And that was how ideas were treated there. <laughs> <laughs> Candace Owens, what was the first time you set up a... <laughs> <laughs> just like, like every single guest <laughs> and they're just like letting them kill the cops are just letting them kill people and they're like they're technically not killing anybody it's like the people are making the choice to die yeah yeah Fine. right and then sam well, you know, sam harris would have the the thought experiment and like okay but but what about people who could do jigsaw that didn't have the same attentions <laughs> well, Sam Harris will what find out like one of them listened to My Chemical Romance and will interpret that as like fundamentally they wanted to die anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, these are facts. <laughs> I was like, well, we're gonna do our gulag because it does oh, involve yeah, yeah, Sam yeah. Harris. But I love I love that like Sam among many things that I really don't like about Sam Harris, I, I do it's like we talked last week about the ball. Did you watch the Jordan Peterson debate with Michael Eric Dyson? 
I did not. Yeah, I, it, was, I, I, uh, it was a good use of your time. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and but just the balls of a guy who like in the same week he has a New York Times article coming out where he's like dragons are real to be like you better quantify racism to me or it doesn't exist that's that's some real like that's brass and for like Sam Harris's whole brand is like facts are facts and facts are real and real are facts and facts are things and then to be like but in my mind what if we were on a spaceship and I was reading Auden, and you were reading the Quran. Yeah, <laughs> you would be worse. Therefore, this six-year-old Palestinian needed to be shot in the face. Yeah, it's weird. Like the the that they've like all gone to Peterson is weird because Peterson's whole thing is like it's religion, but like God is like God is like Ty Lopez. <laughs> It's like so fucking weird. Hi, this weird. is a car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How'd I get this car? <laughs> yeah. The Ten Commandments are that you have to read a book every day. <laughs> <laughs> I like my Ferrari, but the cars, are, but these are a lot more important. They're my books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like it, it, <laughs> that would actually be so much more likable. Yeah, it, but, but it's like, it like shows that they like never really believed anything because it's like. Yeah, I've taken religion and I've taken out all the parts where people have like cool magical powers and can blow people up and there's a battle between <laughs> Satan, but it's like all the rules and there's like all the hierarchy, but it's still religion. And it's like, wasn't it his entire argument that like the, the structure of religion is like illogical and they're like... It's logical. Yeah, his, yeah. well, it's basically his project, he's trying to basically fuse together like young and social Darwinism. Yeah. So he's sort of like, everything is like, the scientific processes of hierarchy and then they're validated through mythology which is like i don't know it's the I mean, zeitgeist. It's, it would sound a lot cooler in a rap record well it's like zeitgeist like, shit it, right yeah it's like, it's it like, is like zeitgeist shit but it's like he like Except made zeitgeist, zeitgeist guy boring. wants us to be nicer though right he wants us to be nicer and it's like interesting but peterson's like Peterson like finds ancient messages and like fucking Sumerian fertility goddesses, but they're like, oh yeah, that's uh, telling you that you should always listen to your boss. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's an ancient method, that... an ancient message. It was a Mesopotamian artifact that said you should get in ten minutes before you're on the clock. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's like it's like it's like the shittiest version of Halo. It's like he found all the Forerunner artifacts, but they're like. Oh, you should always double knot tie your shoes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's all, all this shit is just a naturalized capitalism, right? Like, yeah. That is yeah, like, yeah. to the extent that there's like any type of actual juice to get out of the stuff. Is it's just like, and therefore you should shut the fuck up and report to your job promptly. Dude, he's just a self help writer. He, well, Which is the largest, like, if you go to any bookstore, it's the largest section in any American bookstore. I mean, he saw the market and he wrote the book. Some he's cash, also, like, making cash money. hay on, like, the, the cat, like, <laughs> what's going on politically, though, right? Like, he's a, he's, a, he's also a political operator. I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, he's, I mean, he's, he's kind of like a shaman. He's mm -hmm. like a right, he's like a fascist self-help shaman who cries all the time. That's the other amazing thing, like. I gotta say, for like I, every time I watch this guy, I'm like, when the fuck? Like, I'm like a fucking like Marxist who doesn't like run around. Like, I, I but like, who's the like? What? Why are we like not the pussies here? Like, I'm all. You know. I mean, like, I personally like, um, you know, the only times like you should feel anything as an adult are like <laughs> listening to Kevin Gates, <laughs> Gray Fox's death scene from Metal Gear Solid One. <laughs> In in Dune, when right. uh, Gurney Halleck says, "Long live Duke Leto," those are about the three times you should feel anything. What about Joe Budden records? Uh, well, yeah. you know, emotional yeah. rap. Yeah. Is the fourth I, category. Say, I feel a lot yeah. for Joe Budden. But uh, but like yeah, he's. Um, I mean, self help is going to be the religion in America until Mormonism finally takes over because Christianity can't. Like most Christianity isn't. It can't solve the problem of America because America is almost too psychotically positive for Christianity, even Protestantism. Right. And the like the problem of eternity is something that like American Christianity can't address because eternity eternity of anything is fucking meaninglessness. But Mormons solved it by being like, no, 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 there's hierarchy in heaven too. You can be like the king of heaven if that you're is good at it. Awesome. You're you're God. And 
like people have tried like the the sort of cultural uh fission that comes from evangelicism which is america trying to reconcile with like scots irish protestantism it just all those people's lives are disastrous like they're technically upper middle class but they're drowning in debt and they fucking hate their families and that's why they <laughs> voted for trump whereas mormons are like they also voted for trump and they're also no bad, the mormons are a lot let's be real here mormons are a whole lot nicer to deal with they're a lot nicer like to deal with yeah, like on their lot, face but yeah. they're like vicious in business like they're like mitt romney right but they're like right. they're they're the perfect american religion because they're like oh no this is a very like illogically optimistic culture more so than probably any on earth they, has to we, be what other what yeah. else well we love actually, hierarchy we have to answer what is america in well the it's of the bible it's interesting you say this though because this actually is now i don't have to ham-handedly get us to the gulag because now you're hitting our marks here there is a way that you can believe in some type of quote-unquote secular cult and there is blowing people up and there is fierce hierarchy and there is actually potentiality of being the sovereign king or monarch of other galaxies and that's of course the utter and unbelievable dick riding of elon musk in this country yeah yeah and yeah. that takes us to the tonight's gulag where there is a collision of just like pure shithead on shithead con uh, conflict so brett stevens who of course is you know he writes for the new york times and he sort of like sketches out like Hey, I mean, fucking Hillary lost, so global warming might be fake. Ha, think about it. Or, or, or his more serious beat, which is like, you know, that that three year old, uh, three month old Palestinian was menacing. <laughs> Something yeah. like that. IDF guy had no choice. He was really, the Palestinian kid was reaching for a kite. Uh, but he actually wrote an anti Elon Musk column. The first half of which actually was basically accurate. Like this guy's like a kind of overrated government contractor and an egomaniac who's threatening, you know, media essentially because he doesn't. He's having a hissy fit over coverage, and he called him the Trump of Silicon Valley. And then he kind of started getting into like the like, you know, I mean, Tesla. I mean, global warming's bullshit. You know, he started going off the rails. Right. Well, like yeah, towards yeah. the end, he says that we're basically going to use the internal combustion engine forever. Yeah. Which is like fucking that was so cool that was pretty like, that was he was just like it's goddamn efficient and it works i always like he was always my least favorite one of those guys because he's so fucking boring yes like there's no there's none of like david brooks's existential crisis david like, is david, not happy david brooks is like he's like a david o russell character so it's like yes. kind of interesting or like you know fucking david russell russell character is a little more creative than david brooks we that's true think. You have to put these on a handicap. David Brooks is almost like what's that Jack Nicholson movie? With oh, the Weatherman. Oh wait, what? the other one. No, no, the one where he's in Nebraska driving a camper. I know which one you're talking about. I yeah. forgot the title. Somebody basically anything of like imploded middle aged desperation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is David Brooks. Yeah, and Maureen yeah. Dow just like just goes for it. You know, like <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. just always like okay, uh, but <laughs> I think Mar Marie Dowd was definitely like, living her best life before that was a thing. Yeah, yeah. She's like, yeah, I'm just gonna drink a martini and make up a fake conversation I just had where I called Obama pussy. Yep. Exactly, like, and that's in the New York Times. Yeah, uh, so that's what I did. Fucking Thomas Friedman is an auteur. <laughs> he just invented a whole like style of shitty comments. But Brett Stevens is fucking boring. Right. That's why like the Wall Street Journal wanted to get rid of him because he was boring. Right. Like they had like. People who were way more nuts than him, like Kathleen Parker. But Kathleen Parker goes for it. Like, media is entertainment, and Brett Stevens is mostly not entertaining. It's like, oh, uh, you got me a younger version of Bill Crystal who uses more words. Thanks, man. Yeah. But when he busts <laughs> Thank, something out thanks like— Thanks for the upgrade. <laughs> yeah, when you bust something out like, we're going to use the internal combustion engine forever, it's like, okay, maybe— he needed some more time on, like, you know, a triple A team, but he's, like, got some raw talent. That's exactly down there. what I thought. It's like a, a player it, like uh, that you've always dismissed, and then you see them in the right game, and you're just like, you know what? I, mea culpa. Yeah, because it's just I such yeah. a it's such a fucking stupid idea. Like, why? What, what, what was his reasoning for that? Because it's, he literally said something to the effect of, like, it's efficient. It's like it's a good way to get around. It's like not. It's, 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 it's just not. It's just not. Yeah. So this is Sam Harris intervening because Sam Harris, I think I think the subtext with people like Sam Harris is that they really like 
they want to be like the court philosophers in like a Silicon Valley dictatorship. Mm -hmm. So Sam Harris goes, Brett, I'm a fan of your work and celebrated your move. To Everything with Sam Harris is so fucking melodramatic. Yeah, he talks like just... a wedding invitation. Yes. Always. <laughs> like a very mellow. You, yeah. are, you are cordially invited. <laughs> yeah. I celebrated your move to New York Times. <laughs> but this extraordinarily, like, what is this? Why can't you just say cynical attack? Like, if I was if I was a college, like, professor or high school teacher, and I was just, I would just say, like, you know, whatever, like, this is an A minus because you have enough, like, social capital to, like, you know, be like a little jerk off that knows how to write something. But you can just say, like, but this is a cynical attack, not an extraordinarily. Like everything is just always the overkill with this fucking. You, guy. you know what it reminds me of? Yeah. Um, sometimes, like I follow academics and World Star on Instagram, and yes. I'll get like D so DJ academics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who like open invitation to play Fortnite with me? I will get you a dub. But uh, <laughs> sometimes they aggregate like you know XXX Tentacion on like his Instagram story. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. And X is like phrase, like his phraseology is really funny to me because he's he sort of does this sort of thing where he goes, um, he says things like, you know, and I would never try to detest your name. I'm trying to create a positive <laughs> attribute for the energy of this conversation. It's just like fucking nonsense. <laughs> that's, that's what we say before and every show. That's how Sam Harris talks. <laughs> yes, he, that is exactly how he talks. But this is an extraordinarily cynical attack on a man who's doing as much to move humanity in a positive direction that anyone you can name, please get your shit together. Whoa, my Oh, <laughs> I need my, mo I need my board up for that. <laughs> please get your shit together. And then I love he in the classic fucking snitch move. He ats Elon Musk. Oh, what a bitch. Which, which is like literally an invitation to have like an infantile, like bratty multi-billionaire whose actual businesses are in trouble and has basically been hinting at like a media vendetta for days on Twitter yeah. to be like, Elon, put him in your sights yeah, and then fund my next, uh, you know, biofeedback project where I prove that Muslims are more violent than other people. Yeah, this is, well, yeah. this is like, okay, so Robert Mercer is like out of the game. Right. Because people like yelled at him and he was like, <laughs> well, I didn't get involved in funding shadowy far right movements for this. Um, and, Re and his daughter. I, I was I was just trying to positify your amplify. <laughs> yeah, I was not trying to test anyone's name. I was trying to create a positive dialogue about the energy around your name. But. And his daughter just doesn't have the same money to spend, but, like, Elon Musk does. And Elon Musk is, like, a petty enough person that he would spend probably more than Robert Mercer, even though Mercer has more liquid capital. And so, like, you have, like, fucking assholes like Sam Harris. Try, like, the new thing is to jockey for the new rich guy. Yes. It's like, you know, if it, anything in the past week has showed you, like, we're in a very healthy society. It's like <laughs> we have... Several severely <laughs> mentally ill people who the most depraved industry in America gives millions of dollars to represent our views and resentments to who, you know, each side tries to get the other fired. Um, <laughs> just, just people who were already not well and had their brains poisoned by working in entertainment. And now just different cynical YouTube guys can jockey position for like the richest guy with the most resentment. It's good, you know? It's like I we haven't Yeah, we're in a really good place. I don't know. Like I, it's easy to criticize this thing, but like have we really been doing it long enough that we know that it's like a sign of cultural degeneration? I don't know. It's we'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Uh what is this Jordan Peterson thing that you dug up? Oh, this is him talking about the double helixes. And oh, yeah. Oh, okay, we got to yeah. do this. We got to do this. We got to do this a second. Then we'll get to... We got to get out of the gutter and get to Farrakhan soon, though. This is from China. This is from China. So Go to work. this is... So Give this is man a Foxy and <laughs> new, uh, I think I've got that right. But I, I just love that representation. It's, it's so insanely cool, this representation. So you see the sort of the primary mother and father of humanity emerging from this underlying snake-like entity with its tails tangled together. I think that's a rep I really do believe this, although it's very complicated to explain why. I really believe that's a representation of DNA. <laughs> it's complicated so, to explain. And that, that representation, that entwined double helix, that is everywhere. You can see it in, in Australian Aboriginal art. And I'm using the Australians as an example because they were isolated in Australia for like 50,000 years.
Mm, fucking A. Something you don't learn everywhere. I, uh, fucking A makes you think, doesn't it? Okay, well, I'm going to buck the trend a little here. He's, it actually sounds kind of cool. Okay, so, like, yes, Jordan Peterson is, like, the ultimate we live in a society guy. Like, he's the ultimate I just, like, smoked a seed blunt. Here's what I think, guy. <laughs> <laughs> but... But, like, I actually, like, did know a guy who's like, nah, dude, you smoke a seed blunt, you'll come to amazing realizations. <laughs> He's one of the, like, many stupid guys I've known in my life who were just slightly more stupid than me and, like, made me think I was really smart. But, uh, uh I do think it is, there, that is, like, an interesting, that's, like, the type of thing that I wish was explored by people who, like, weren't Zeitgeist Guy or Jordan Peterson. I, it's you know like, what? I'm yeah, why you. is that an alarm? That's kind of interesting. But it's, like, you know, uh, I'm sure like there's a longer version of the clip where she just has some t- fucking insane, stupid <laughs> explanation that well, he's very that's... self-assured about. You know, but well, that's the, that's actually the part that cracks me up because especially like for this world, I'm like incredibly like woo agnostic, and I'm not like one of these like that's not factual. Like I don't fucking like. I think that more like good left people should be like, well, I don't want to like whatever. Like you should be fucking going on ayahuasca trips I and meditating yeah. and, and like figuring like your world is not just Sam Harris bullshit at all like, I 100% believe in astrology even if it's not real <laughs> it's true like, yeah, exactly. I believe in a lot of weird goofy shit that I admit is goofy but it's like you believe it you believe it yeah why not if you believe it you believe it exactly <laughs> so so but I mean but no but I think that it's 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 the Shorty, like this guy could be like, see, that was because your 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 uh, moon was in retrograde, so you had your period, so therefore we need to legalize child labor. If a pres- <laughs> if a pres- <laughs> this reminds me of that that story in the Toronto whatever yes. paper, because if a professor said. I can't go into why I think this well, is true. Well, that's but fucked like, up. That's why it's funny. Like, what that's the fuck fucked am I up. Paying that's what ma- exactly. That's what makes it fucked up. I mean, the the I think the subtext of this is like I feel like a lot of like diehard like men who like Jordan Peterson would watch that clip and be like, "Yeah, totally, you know. <laughs> aliens told us about the double helix or whatever his explanation is." But like you know, if a woman likes astrology, they're like, well, bitches are so fucking stupid. Everyone should have like a dumb, dumb thing that they like that has something to it. You know, I agree it with that. I actually, better. it makes you, I agree with that completely. I actually like, I actually like that, that Jordan Peterson, not all, like he literally has the personality of like a sexist, like 1950s, like God damn it, woman, get control <laughs> yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he like literally <laughs> That is like the group and the individual. And, oh, you son of a bitch! Like it's just this like constant cascade of like imbalanced emotionality and overreaction, and like what's coming out amidst like the sea of tears and histrionics is you should straighten up. Yeah, <laughs> men need to be men. <laughs> yeah, it's that's the that's the thing is like he he like went into the ancient truths of the universe and it just like <laughs> just fucking like boring like what color is your parachute shit. Right. Well, I mean, right. I think that like he's just like a shitty version of Joe Rogan. Oh, I I think yeah. that's totally true. Uh Joe Rogan, you could say what like he I think he's like easily swayed by people. And maybe, like, doesn't know as much as he thinks he does. But I think he kind of has, like, a good heart in some ways. I just... I don't know what kind of heart Jordan Peterson has. I can't... That's a very angry one. It's an angry heart. But that's the new type of guy. Because bitches be trifling. Isn't it funny, though, that, like, the new type of guy that everyone loves that is in every, like... Every well-represented, like, political or social ideology is just like really melodramatic middle-aged men now it's like after everything changed like everything is was supposed so to have changed and like really rapidly in the past few years but it's like okay so yeah everything's totally different now uh we've changed the culture so the biggest guys are uh james comey <laughs> you know james jordan comey is, peterson james comey's very messy That's yeah true. just a, just yeah. a bunch of like melodramatic fucking catty 60 year old men it's so weird it is really that is actually really as opposed really to like bizarre. what like Indian War veterans and like World War II veterans and that. Sort well, you of know thing. what it was, but I'm it's always that's the thing though. It's always been that, but the more 
like the more that we think we change things, we just get the same shit. Well, no, and there used to be a little bit more plausible deniability. Like I, I, I watch because I'm a fucking glutton for punishment. I watched that new McCain documentary on HBO, <sighs> and oh, you fucking can't wow. stand that piece of shit. Absolutely, but I'm gonna say something like j this is just like a, a sky is blue comment. The fact that that dude could basically be like, I spent. Like, I was tortured for five years is, like, some objective corollary to all of this shit talking. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, like there was at least, and even, like, and even like fucking John Kerry. Like, John, like, I was in my fucking, you know, fly airplanes and shit. Like, there was at least in that generation some, like, bullshit... Usually, I mean, fucking grotesque. Like, I participated in an imperial mass murder in Vietnam. Yeah, I made my had... dad let me fly the plane right. again after I fucked it up. <laughs> right. Well, versus I've been crying in a Toronto classroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. come on. Like, there's, yeah. there's a little difference there. Well, I think it's, like, I think, like, if anything, like, if I, we could have a whole conversation about how, like, Trump one in this way that he sort of turned everyone into him like ev yeah. like everyone who paid attention to politics like started paying more attention to politics in 2016 is now just all they do is consume media and it makes them fucking crazy and that's him that's him they became him yeah, but dude. if yeah. any he also like destroyed a lot of people's uh preconceptions of what is necessary or what's okay or what's a norm one of those things was with like john mccain it was like <laughs> Where it's like, do we, do, he, we have he, that, he, do we have that hand? Yeah, where he like, he kind of has a point where he's like, like, okay, so is this guy good because he like fucked up being a pilot? That's what, that's like why he's an interesting person, why his opinion's worthwhile. And it's like, you know, he's as much of a piece of shit as John McCain, but he's also like, right. He's right about that. And I think people saw that. And they're like, yeah, why do you why do we need some like arbitrary sacrifice to enjoy our melodramatic old men? <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's just get straight to it. Yeah, I got to say, though, I think that like that the problem with Rogan now is that Rogan is another person that's just completely fucking given in to like, you know, like I'm like a 50 year old, like multimillionaire actor yeah. and like absolutely whatever minor annoyance there is to me is completely a macro reflection of the world. So like definitely kids being like crying about Ben Shapiro. Yeah. That's the biggest threat to democracy. Exactly. On Earth. Like that's where he really, and also the gender shit to mm -hmm. the point where like anybody that obsesses that much about gender to me, I get a little bit like, uh, all right, man. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it, there is something like very cruel about it, you know, but, yeah. Uh, no, I like yeah. the guy, but I've just I no, feel yeah, like I know he's fallen mean. off in the last like couple. Like he's, I think he's gotten more into that shit. I think like wealth and fame is like fame more Fun. so is terrible for you. I think it's like one of the worst things that can happen to your brain. And I'm not saying they have it worse than anyone. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying like feel bad for these people, but I am saying that it like it alters people's perception of the world. Like I was thinking about that Dave Chappelle thing about Martin Lawrence. Right. But and also, like, I think that m money does have this entrancing power to people that's very real. I, I feel like people come into like seven, eight figure sums and it completely rewires their brain because so much of your most people's lives is like, am I going to have enough money to do this? Am I going to have money? Then you get to the point where it's like, I don't have to think about those things anymore. And that's what they call that's like the eighty thousand dollar threshold for like a single person where you don't have to worry about the things that you did and then you go higher and higher and unless you have like a break where you're like okay it's like kind of absurd if i don't have kids if i don't have a wife if I, my family doesn't need this it's absurd for me to keep all this i should give a lot of this away right <clears throat> you spend more time rationalizing why you should have it and it makes you disconnect from people because for people that are like extremely into the logical vision of the world, there is nothing logical about someone having, you know, fucking fifty million dollars. Well, it's that's, that's it's like fucking, fucking obscene. That, now you're talking about fucking communism, dude. But that's that's the thing. It's like <laughs> if you listen to him talk like a few years ago, like he's like No, he would he would very say, reasonable. Would, yeah, it's, but it's, it's money up. money like, makes that you guy money makes you crazy. Ditches. Like he should make fucking money. Yeah, money makes you fucking crazy because you either separate yourself like past a certain point. 
or you spend more and time, more and more time rationalizing why you should have it. And the only way you can rationalize why you should have it is both that everyone and everything in the world is like a problem, an existential problem, and that you are so much better than everyone. So I read, I read a, I, there was a piece that came out. Oh man, it's a while ago now, but it was like the economic part of like it was uh, by the same guy who actually wrote Emotional Intelligence, and he was saying, and it, no, he's like it's actually studied that even on like a really basic level that all of these social interactions that humans need to cultivate in themselves, if they have, if they're anywhere on the spectrum from, you know, like, I mean, seriously economically deprived, like I was growing up or even just like middle class, you have like a situation where, Oh shit, I need to stay later at work. My neighbor needs to like, uh, you know, my, my kid needs to go over to my neighbor's house and like play with their kids and whatever. So you need to have like a relationship with your neighbor, not just like out of self interest. Right, you right. just literally need to constantly be relating to other people right. because you live in a socially embedded way. And then when money cancels all of that, they were doing the research in the piece was like literally like down to the level of like, you don't need to read other people's facial expressions in the same Ex way. Yeah, exactly. You don't need to cue into like any type of proper protocol for being human because you can just fucking bypass all of it. So, yeah. So, okay. So I like the way I get paid is sort of like a freelancer because I'm like in part owner proprietor right. in my own thing. Right. I make about like pre-tax. I pay quarterly taxes and it like usually works out to about like anywhere from like 20 to 33% depending on like what is deductible and what isn't. Right. Um, make about like $110,000 a year. Right. Which is like, you know, I grew up like not really having to worry about things, but I, you know, I wasn't just sort of completely buttressed by my parents into adulthood. Right. You know, more so than other people for sure. But like, I feel like never having to expect never expecting to have like made that much because i like sucked at school i just didn't like it i sucked at like trying to find work anything that's happened to me now is like fucking it's unreal to me it's hyper real it, like it makes no sense Felix to me that i just that, 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 didn't that, expect to go anywhere yeah well it's it like, like i, like I the, just the like hyper real hour. posted my whole life and then it's like yeah. okay enough people like your post that they're just going to give you and your friends like a million dollars a year and you can pay whoever to do whatever. And it's like, okay, I guess. But like my experience with like not e expecting to come into that in a very short time was like, holy shit, I can like buy my way out of so many problems, right? Yep. Like any inconvenience that forces people to like depend on each other in some way, it's not, I can just buy my way out of it. Right. Like I got... I got like mugged and I didn't, I like my keys were in my wallet and I forgot. And instead of like, you know, like seeing if anyone I knew had spares or like I could stay with someone, I'm like, Oh, I'll just like go to a hotel room. Yep. And I think that, that there like became a point where it just like, it made me hyper disconnected after a while because I'm, I'm one of those people like left to their own devices. I'll just like sit around and only go to the gym and then play video games with their friends I'm like that type of guy, no matter like, no matter what low body fat percentage I get to or how many, <laughs> I'm like that type of person Nice. that it like, it made me sort of insane. And I, I don't know. I like, it made me start like setting aside like a percentage of it. I should like give away every month. And I'm not saying that to be like, Oh, I'm a great person, but it just to say like, just it, the more you hoard it and use it to buy your way out of humanity, it will make you fucking nuts. It will make you fucking insane. And I wish there was something I wish that I wish like, you know, people always talk about how there should be like financial education for like, you know, kids in school. Right. Because all of like this grinded out lower middle class, temporary class experience that is so typical for people. But I also wish there was something for people that do come into money to tell them like, you know, you think this is going to make you a lot happier to hoard this to a certain point, but it's just, it's going to make you fucking crazy. But I've it's just, not good for you. I hear that about I, athletes a lot, too. Yeah. But it's so amazing to me, though, just, like, the perspective. Because, like, so, like, I would say, like, in the last year of my life is the first time in my life ever where there wasn't just, like, and it's not, you know, like, it's not, it's not a high number now. 
but like I'm fine. There's a lot more that needs to like be done, whatever. Like things are fine. That's the first time in my life I've ever experienced that, right? Like I grew up, my family get like evicted from apartments. We've like you know lived in apartments and you know and for a variety, you know, combination of reasons, combination of my own like career desires and willingness to take risks, and also the fact that like I wasn't you know I wasn't really suited for taking direction at a lot of places, <laughs> you know, like I went through this process, but like, and so I, so it's, it's funny because part of like what animates and motivates so much of what I do is just this feeling that like nobody should have that experience and that feeling. Mm -hmm. and it's fucking disgusting and totally unnecessary that any human being live with that material, psychic, emotional, uh, whatever. And I would say, and I know even on a relative scale, I experienced very less of it compared to a lot of other people, but even just a taste of like, I don't know what's for dinner is fucking horrible and nobody should experience it ever. And then it's funny hearing you because it's like, you're so attuned to it, honestly, just hearing you that like, you're talking about numbers that like, especially in New York city, I mean, there's other people that like, you're like, oh man, that's just like scratching the surface of like their sense of like how to get by. And then I know other, and I've other people who like make millions of dollars a year and their reference point is someone who makes hundreds of millions of dollars a year and they feel deprived. Well, on, honest, which is, honestly, my dollar goes farther just from not drinking. That's where like 30% of people's income goes in this fucking that city. That is so true. <laughs> that is so fucking yeah. true. That's why you come in with the like, and we're like, would you like a beer? It's like, do you have a lime flavored kombucha? I literally, ju I literally <laughs> just asked for seltzer when I came here. That's not a fancy drink. Hey, Everyone don't, hey, it. Hey, don't fuck up the bit. <laughs> don't fuck up the bit. The seltzer though is decent. I could work that another way. This is some Jew material there. All right, <laughs> let's take a look, uh, guys. You really got to become a patron because we're gonna get to so much good shit in the pro in the post game. But we got to play uh, this Farrakhan thing, and then. Uh, and then one of the Alex Jones uh, sounds. But let's start with the... And then we're going to play another with an amazing graphic from David Slavic in the postgame, another gulag or re-education tournament. But this is Louis Farrakhan. He was on, I believe this is a radio show in Chicago. Um, life goals, obviously. If I book Farrakhan for the show, I'll have you in, Felix. Oh, yeah, dream come true. Yeah. <laughs> this is the, the brother minister talking about Trump's record. And actually, I've honestly... I've never. This is gonna. I'm gonna have to revive. Do you, do you do a Farrakhan impression, Felix? Oh no, I have. I okay. do such shitty impressions no, that's, that I haven't that's even. Not true. I can do like a certain type of impression. I can do like. Well, some no, of, you do. You got. You got a good Obama. You got good Hillary. But Obama is just Midwestern. Like Obama's easy right. to do because it's just like Midwestern cadence. I Farrakhan well, devil. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, Farrakhan's yeah. like, he's very difficult to do for me. This devil can't transcend the Midwest. Yeah, there's like this um, yeah. glide to his voice that's hard to imitate. I've never heard, I've never seen him this peppy. Let's let's check it out. Let's see if, let's see how you respond to this clip. Some people would argue that it's better now that the racism is more in our face rather than hitting hidden. Excuse me. What's your perspective on that? Well, that wasn't the intent mm -hmm. of this administration mm -hmm. to do a lot of good for us, but the nature of this administration is good for us. Because now, you know, sometimes you think you're where you are not. And so Trump is letting you know where you really stand. Oh. And because of Trump's way, he is an anomaly. There's never been no president <laughs> quite like Mr. Trump. But there's something that he's doing. I'm going to come out in a few weeks and talk about it. But Trump is destroying every enemy that was an enemy of our rise. Oh. Who's the enemy of our rise? <laughs> is it the Department of Justice where we get none? <laughs> is it Congress where you make a law that favors us and then you turn around and destroy it? Is it the media that has destroyed every black leader that stood up for us, calling us out of our name? Martin Luther King suffered it. Malcolm suffered it. Dubois suffered it. Marcus like Garvey Malcolm. suffered it. <laughs> Pause it. So yes, I did want to say Louis Farrakhan should really keep Malcolm X's name out of his fucking mouth. 
and we can have fun with this clip, but very important point. Word. I mean, I don't know. No one knows if he like. No, he didn't, did, but, but he, he helped like, instigate exactly, the environment yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh -huh. he's attacking the media, calls it fake news. Well, I don't think everything is fake, but I know, <laughs> right. I know very well <laughs> right. that we have been the victims of yeah. some fake news. Yes. <laughs> he's beating up the FBI. Go at I mean, it, yeah, baby! Yeah. <laughs> because they've been beating the hell out of us yeah. ever yeah. since J. Edgar Hoover and the counterintelligence program of the U.S. Yeah. government. So, go ahead, Mr. Trump. Uh, Felix, uh, as I say, major influence on both of us. What yeah. do you think? I mean, so, I was, I said this the other day, but the thing that, like, no one, no one ever wants to, like, own up to this about Farrakhan. Yeah. Not like the people who cynically like bring him up to weaponize him against the left, nor like the people who really like aren't NOI but like kind of ride for him in a way. He's like a conservative, very he kind of always has been. He's yep. not like he's not a fucking Marco Rubio conservative, he's like a trad conservative. <laughs> like, he's almost <laughs> if LaRoche was a bit more consistent, he's like LaRochean. Yep, and but this is also the perfect Farrakhan clip because. There's, like, a grain of truth in a lot of it. Mm -hmm. There's a grain of truth. That like, yeah, the FBI fucking sucks, you know? And it's, like, it is, I would imagine it's pretty hard, to, like, for a lot of people to go, no, protect the FBI, even if it's, like, this whole other thing of, like, okay, the president shouldn't be able to do X to X investigation, which is, you know, also true. But Farrakhan... Uh, this um hold on sorry i have to look up who who did this exactly someone like wrote one of the only good twitter threads i've ever read uh rebecca pierce who's like a journalist and a filmmaker she's done a lot of very good work about refugees in israel and she said a lot about how you know people who had him said things that were you know farrakhan will say something that's like 32% true right. guys who would say the whole thing that was true. They were systematically destroyed by the FBI and the police Absolutely. and every, and the media. And so it's sort of annoying for people. Like, of course people are going to rally around Farrakhan. If you destroy everyone else who's saying anything close to him and you leave this one guy, yeah, people are going to fucking rally around him. But no, uh, I think, and I also yeah. think there, it's what's weird about him is like, I, look, I don't have any problem saying, like you said, like Farrakhan's right wing, and on some level, on a super base level, you know, you could say like, look, if you want to build like fucking liberatory left wing politics, then yeah, like actually anti semitism and homophobia, like those are that's fucked up, that's wrong, that's not going to work, that's reality. But there is this like certain type of like concern troll, including by the way, like I would say you and I maybe I don't know how old you are, but I would say like 27. Maybe, OK, so you're young. But I would say like, me, OK, so you but like, I don't know, man, like we were and I'm, I'm, I'm 34. Right. So we're at the very last. Like if, if somebody if somebody is 30 or under, I would even maybe say 40 or under actually talking like Farrakhan with some type of actual presence in their lives, that's a fucking lie. And there's right. a certain type of like person that like Farrakhan is like the go to like boogeyman for anything that makes them feel uncomfortable about anything ever, mm -hmm. including something that has stuff that has nothing to do with anti Semitism, nothing to do with homophobia, but like any criticism of Israel, any forthright talk about white supremacy. And they go there and they use him like as this delusional false equivalency. Right. And it's just, I don't know, why does he fucking trigger lame people so much? It's because embarrassing. I don't think it's that he triggers them. I think that... You think it's cynical? I think like one of the one of the stories about this past 20 years that we're eventually going to tell when we're far past it is that it was a search for identity by people who wanted a special identity. And by that, I mean it was people who had every advantage in society but wanted the same pride in identity that they thought other people were freely allowed to have, this sort of envy of it. And I think for the, a lot of the people that 
bitch about Farrakhan the most sort of come from like my background. And I think for them, it's like, it's thrilling the same way Israel's thrilling. They're like, oh, finally, I can, I have a little bit of that. I have a little bit of that identity points. I can say that I'm threatened right. by something. I can say that I'm made right. unsafe on something. I can define this identity around, you know, hate I perceive towards me, even though it's not even close to the same thing that other people experience. But it's like, you know, we, we people are often piggish and impulsive and we have a piggish and impulsive society and i think for a lot of people if they saw people sort of build this identity around their oppression their first thought wasn't like how do we address this it was like i want what that is without right. any of I the, the next, negative yeah. aspects i want yeah i would like to yeah so i would like all of the ethos of suffering yeah. without any of the actual suffering yeah and it's like i don't think right. i don't actually think like Jake Tapper or someone is like scared of Farrakhan. It, it, you, I mean, you don't think Jake Tapper is up at night being like, you oh, know, if Asada Shakur him? could make a sneak attack from Cuba. Yeah, they know it's not going to happen. And it's like, I think they kind of, they want Farrakhan to be more of an ideologue than he is. Because the truth is he's a scam artist. Right. Farrakhan is a fucking huckster. He got... Uh, yeah, he he needed readings. Yeah, that, he did Scientology op- shit. Yeah. And right. he's... Like the the shit with Trump now, it's like just savvy media operating by him. Farrakhan's a huckster; he's not fucking dumb. Right. Like he's stayed on top of this for a while because he's a very savvy guy, and he's like made these strategic allies along the way that benefited him and kept his name in the news in the right way. And he's sort of maintained his grasp around people who sort of feel like they didn't have anywhere else to go or were like you know their, maybe their parents were enraptured by previous leaders in noi but it is it is like just incredibly fucking cynical it's incredibly cynical like how he's deployed and it's like yeah obviously so much of what he says is like shitty and bigoted and everything but it's like he clearly is not the same he doesn't have like the same power as the other things that people criticize it's insane yeah there's no i mean i know listen to two doubles are going to talk about the brother minister (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean, so those are the same people that put Booju Batson in jail. But that's the okay, Reverend Wright. They want our music? Well, Reverend Wright was right. He was totally right. Reverend Wright was right about everything. He didn't say anything. I never bigoted. said anything racist. And they fucking destroyed him. He talked him. about U.S. empire and racism at home, which, by the way, is a, is a very legitimate critique that could be leveled at liberal, uh, you know, at 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 liberal favorites like Ta-Nehisi Coates and Michael Eric Dyson, who might be very articulate and important in, in certain things, but don't connect a global critique. We were talking about this just before the show. Reverend Wright was doing that from a fucking pulpit, and Wright, and in fact, I remember when I first saw Reverend Wright, I was, you know, I was wasn't like I was like I know that Obama is going to need to like get away from this electorally, but for the first time, I was like, oh, Obama might be a good president. It, it, it like ta- that, it, that's an awesome he's got a good minister it taught me the opposite thing i i, I kind of yeah. thought because it was like you know one thing you can say for the clintons yeah they're like loyal to a fault for people who ride for them right that's true like anthony fucking won <laughs> like yeah. how was he like still around their orbit but it's just yeah, like he played if by he, the rules he didn't he didn't betray us yeah peter dow but, peter dow like isn't good at anything yeah and they're like Oh well, he's like loyal, so we'll like just keep him afloat. But well, they're not. The Obama's a neo-lib technocrat, and the Clintons are politically, but their operational styles like some real old school fucking. They're the mafia. farmland shit. Like, yeah. well, I don't know. He might have Down syndrome, but he was there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, and Obama, but I don't Obama, care. Obama was like, "This is my preacher. I'm going to shiv him in front of I you know, to show you how true. much that's I want." A good point. I mean, it's like, and like Lonnie Davis might have been trying to sniff Hillary's pantyhose, but I'll tell you what, he was on Fox every single week during the Lewinsky affair. That's the kind of a contract. Oh my god, that's the kind of almost sympathetic thing about the Clintons to me is that they're like. They ride for these people so hard who just end up fucking them. Like always, he, Hillary. Mark Hillary Penn endorsed, just fucked them. Mark Penn. Just Mark fucked fucking them. Penn. Hillary endorses Cuomo, and then he's like, "Yeah, you know, she sucks actually, but it's okay." It's like <laughs> they just—they're the—they just love riding with people who will turn. If Hillary won, like, imagine how quickly like Bill Crystal and shit would have turned on her. It's, but you know what? It is almost an admirable quality. It's almost it's almost like a personally like 
Bet you, I guess. You like I don't Bill know. Clinton's kind of like, if you ride for me, I ride for you. He's a complete piece of shit in like literally every <laughs> other way you can be. But there's something about that that I'm like, hmm, I don't see everyone doing that. Trump to, Trump's favorite thing to do is to turn on people. Right. Always Trump, enjoy, Trump literally yeah. enjoys it. And then Nunberg fucking. Yeah, everyone. And, and then Obama. the guys who got him the most trouble, he's like, we need to bring back Michael Flynn. Like, it <laughs> rules. <laughs> Let's play two clips really briefly. Then we're going to go to the post game. We're playing re-education and gulag. We're going to take all of your calls and I have. But I got to just play first. Do you know the Mikey Rotundo kid? Have you heard about this story? I've heard about the story. I haven't seen any of the clips. All yet. right. So he was interviewed. Alex Jones had him on air. And I just want to say my my takeaway from this is that we should start a campaign for his kid, his parents to immediately reinstate him in his room. <laughs> I think he's a nice kid. I think clearly whatever problems that he's having is obviously their fault. And he's a sweet guy. And I totally support his return to his rightful home in his parents' house. Um, this is the first clip. We're going to just play this for a couple minutes. But what I love about how this starts is that they literally have this kid, Mikey Rotundo. He's just sitting there. And then Alex shows up like 10 seconds in. So we have about... 10 seconds of him just like awkwardly sitting there waiting for the interview to start. And then Alex Jones, who I think Felix, I mean, I think you and I are, you know, take pride in our craft, but I mean, we'd have to both admit that Alex Jones is obviously the greatest broadcaster of our generation. He, right? There's something to it. He's been yeah. doing it for like 20 yeah. years. Yeah, he's a fucking <laughs> genius. So let's watch he's the math. Let's he's watch deep. the master at work here. <laughs> this, this is literally how the segment starts. He just. <laughs> let's, let's just pat it on him. Looking. Oh, he looks like John Romero. <laughs> like, all right. I never got a full front view of his face. He looks yeah. like John Romero from Doom. See you. Catch your plane. Right. Appreciate you coming into Infowars, Michael Rotondo. <laughs> <Rotondo. laughs> also known as the Man of the Week. Player of the Week. They are what, what saying uh, the 30 year old perp man uh, that was just evicted by his parents in New York. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I appreciate your courage coming down here to Texas. <laughs> and I just want to say on a scale of one to 10 people that have drug problems or people that are mentally ill or people that are criminals, you are not even on that scale. Great. Right, it's nice to hear. Well, I'm not going to be condescending. The media made you the ultimate demon in the world, both liberal and conservative media. I was seeing Even that. the left that pushes dependency and paying for people's anchor babies and sex changes. I shouldn't have paid for somebody's sex change or, or their nose job. And so I was kind of jumping on you a few days ago, a little bit, but still saying, wait a minute. But he's not one tenth as bad as all these other people. I'm not saying I disagree uh, with your parents wanting you out of the house at 30. <laughs> what I am saying is that this whole millennial thing we see of people being obsessed with their phones, being obsessed with television, <laughs> not going out, not getting jobs, you know, uh, being afraid of change. I think Note you are indicative of that and actually later. very, very common. And I don't mean that in a mean way. Okay. Uh, what is <laughs> what is your world perspective on that? Well, um, I, I think that I've just been doing the best I can and I've been setting forth a reasonable effort and... Um, I, I don't think there's really anything uh, wrong with the things that I've done. or I say, I say I'm handing things that I've done thus far. Let so. him home. Let him home. Let him home. You... Yeah, okay. Let's Now let's play. All right. Uh, get, get your, what's your world perspective on that so far, Felix? Alex Jones is... He has the best acceleration rate <laughs> of, of, like, any host because it's like... <laughs> He just like wanders into the set and he's like, all right, I'm ready to go. So you're a fucking loser, but at least you're not trans. And it's like, whoa, you just like hit the ground sprinting, dude. He just hit every single fucking big achievers. Like, hey, how you doing? Yeah. <laughs> all right. We're going to hit transgender people, immigrants, anchor babies. Now I'm going to develop emotional rapport with you. And now I'm going to ask you. This. And then he answers like the Sally Jesse Raphael question. Like, how are you feeling? Yeah, He's like. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like <laughs> no one, no one can do that. Even like the best, bro the best broadcasters like need a warm up. They need like their, right. you know, Coke Zero with lime at the right temperature. <laughs> Alex Jones like any weight. If you shook shook him away in the middle of the time, he'd be like, I don't see why I should have to pay for anyone's hormones. And it's like he's just like ready to go to be a piece of shit at any time. And it's 
<laughs> That's why he's like the, the king. That's why he's the king. In this section they're talking about, and this is another, this is a really, I think you guys will be chanting, let him home with me after you see this. I think Mikey Rotundo is a little bit more woke than you might expect. They're talking about um, radiation and racism here. Media or or just 5G is gonna kill a billion people in the next 20 years from cancer. Uh -huh. Now tell me how uh -huh. the goddamn racism is important. 5G is gonna kill a billion people. Mm -hmm. It's estimated. Uh huh. I, I, what, does it matter what color your skin is? And it's not that the race crap isn't going on. It. The, it's in the WikiLeaks that they project all the race stuff because that's how we're designed. We see each other and what color we are. Right. We don't see radiation blasting through things, man. Right. But the globalists do. Do you understand? Right. I do you understand there is a scientific consciousness that is completely cold-blooded beyond anything you can imagine that is preying on you? And so as a man, you need to gut up and learn what that is and take the threat that's there yep. and stop thinking by protecting yourself in a bubble and being real slow about everything. You're going to do anything. You're not. You're dying. You're dying. You're dying. I would personally, I think that the racism is more important than the... 5G thing because the rate because I mean if we if we die sooner from cancer does it matter if if we if we die sooner does it matter that we led good lives pause it nailed it did you hear that it matters that we led good lives so the racism matters let him home he's like let him home this is a nice game oh there's more I want to play that another minute and then we'll go to the post game but there's it, it's too much my there's, god. Am I, am I, Felix, seriously, am I right? Guys, yeah, no, let him home. He, he, there's something good in this kid's there's, heart. Yeah. Dude, kid, he's older than me. But, <laughs> you know, but he is a kid. Yeah. Look, for a fucking 30-year-old who refuses to leave his parents' home and, like, God only knows what he's up to all day, like, I honestly, sweet nature, he has good politics. For guys like this, like, for guys he's like a good guy. this or, like, Brian Silva... Like the fact that everyone makes fun of them because they are how they are, but you should honestly give them an award yes. for not being alt right. Exactly. You should give them like exactly. A, I would. I would. You know, there should be a government agency that like gives these guys jobs as like he can be like a steam moderator yeah. and lives in like subsidized <laughs> housing. Like Brian Silva is in like a WPA where he like raps. Obama like, takes him on a like the the Wakanda theme park that opens up at Disney or something. Yeah, like, Come yeah. on, young man, let's go see Wakanda together. <laughs> Way to not become a Nazi. Yeah, it's like you know, R.I.P. Yeah. R.I.P. Young King Dave. Young King Dave is another guy who should have been like commended for not like being all right. It's like anytime you see like a fucked up, yeah. like young, not even young, like you're fucked up, like socially fucked up white person on the internet, and they're like weird, and everyone's laughing at them, but they're like not racist. But they're like, hey, racism's kind of wrong. They yeah. should be. Yes, we should do honorary like left degrees for those people. I am totally yeah. ready to give this guy an honorary left degree and say let him home. But let's play another little bit of this, and then we'll go to the post game. Without hatred, see, you're, you're, see, this is this is this is this is the scrambled spiritualism I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> do, you, do you understand that in China there are a hundred plus million people in forced labor camps right now? Now he's in I, his I green. Heard, I haven't heard that specifically, but I've heard there's a lot of terrible things in a lot of different countries. Oh, the the, 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 the central committee <laughs> that's public. Ooh. I personally haven't, all right, I haven't heard They it. say Mao Zedong was responsible for 84 million dead. The Chinese do. Okay. <laughs> That's in the, our CIA says 65 million. I don't know the true number. Mm -hmm. 65, 84, whatever. Do you understand that they're killing millions of Buddhists every year and Christians and selling their organs? I don't, I did not know that. Aww. But see, there's not the psychological fun because it's Asians killing Asians. So it's not as sexy as Oprah Winfrey and Roots. I am always okay. saying that. <laughs> I'm always saying that, that it's not sexy when Asians kill Asians. <laughs> that's, Something that's I've what, noticed. That's what you said. You were like, I, I love doing this show, but don't do that fucking Oprah Winfrey and Roots shit with me. What, <laughs> what, what does he mean like Oprah, Win, Oprah Winfrey and Roots? I like that just not. literally that it's just both like black stuff. Like It's not sexy as black stuff. Yeah, and uh, he's he's a bad person. He's a bad person, <laughs> but it's all it's like his thoughts are so 
the thing about Alex Jones that's like cool is like there's a lot of stuff that's cool. Frankly, that he tells the truth is one. <laughs> yeah, but, I think, uh, yeah. Uh, it's that like his thoughts are as jumbled as like any fucking idiot you'll see in like you know YouTube comments or whatever. We're just like screaming at like a post a selfie from like Zendaya about black on black crime it just makes no it's just like a, a screaming but with totally jumbled thoughts that just nothing links up to anything but he has like this like broadcaster charisma kind of <laughs> yeah and he just says this shit that makes no fucking sense like just no, none of it relates to anything like they could just it could just be from seven sentences put together but he's like confident enough that Hundreds of thousands of people will give him money to do it. It's inspirational for <laughs> for those of us who also have like jumbled thoughts. It's like inspirational. I'm trying to get to that point. Yeah, oh, we all are. Yeah. All right, guys. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do the post game where our Paisan Felix is gonna stay with us, and we're gonna play Gulag or Reeducation Camp. There's a great graphic for it that the great David Slavic has made. We've got more Alex Jones sound. We've got your calls, we've got your IMs, we've got your Discord questions, all of that. Um, we're starting to move fast towards our first 2,000 patrons. So thanks, everybody. We're on the move. Appreciate it a lot. Uh, Woke Bros, Waz and I's new show that's available for TMBS patrons and Count the Dings patrons. New episode this week. Right Wing Mandela animation dropping next week. Um, and, of course, all of the... Um, illicit histories, idea primers, and post games. Lots of content for you. Thank you so much for sustaining what we do and continuing to grow it so we can offer more and more and more. Thanks, everybody. Thank you to super producer Matt Leck, head theoretician David Grishkum, super producer David Slavic. We'll see you in the post game. Of course, thank you to Marisha. <laughs> Marissa Baradaran. Thank you. And to Felix Biederman. We'll see you in the post game. <laughs> <laughs>